So I wanted to go over the triangle homeworks. Um, a lot more people figured out what I was getting at with the idea of a program that determines whether an, a triangle is isosceles or equilateral or scalene given the lengths of the sides of the triangle. But there were still a lot of bugs in the, in the, ho in the problems that I saw. So this was actually a question that I was asked in a Microsoft technical interview when I, when I worked there when I was in college. And the point of it is to recognize that there are some combinations of three valid lengths that don't make a triangle. So you have to consider as one of your cases that you might be equilateral, scalene, isosceles, or not a triangle. For instance, if you have one length that's 100 and another leg that's 1 and another leg that's 1, they won't meet. So the three lengths that you get actually have to satisfy something called the triangle inequality. <coughs> Let me show you. So if we think about a triangle that looks like this, and the two sides don't match up, so this is side length, if this is side length 100 and 1 and 1, then it won't make a triangle at all. And what is the condition that those have to satisfy to make it a triangle? The two shortest sides have to be longer than the longest side. So the sum of, the sum of any two sides has to be longer than the third side. So if I call this side A and I call this side B and I call this side C, then yeah, I have to have A plus B is greater than or equal to, if you want to say that it's a degenerate triangle, this is sort of a valid triangle, 6, length 3, and length 3. I guess that's sort of a valid triangle. It's a triangle with zero area, right? Um, but that's not enough to check, is it? A plus B is greater than or equal to C? We have to try it three times because it may be that actually C isn't the longest side. Yes? Well, how do you, <clears throat> that's kind of a complicated question. You're saying I'm going to instruct the user that they should give me the sides in the order from smallest to longest. Well, I'm saying, what is the longest side? What, what is the longest side if there is a longest side? Right. So you can try to ask the user to give you the, the kind of input that you want, but Another smart practice in coding is to try to be relatively robust to stupid users. And we're going to learn how to use while loops today to check someone's input and make sure they're giving you something valid. And if they aren't giving you something valid, to say, hold on a second, you, you've got to try again. That's not good. That's not a good input. Um, so yeah, if you tell the user it's, that this program only works if you enter the sides in the order uh, from smallest to largest, maybe that's okay. But I mean, it would be just as easy to check these other conditions. This condition and A plus C greater than or equal to B. If any of those is false, then it doesn't make a triangle. So I did get a lot of um, programs that worked okay if I put the side lengths in as 2, 2, 100, but the code didn't work if I put the side lengths in as 100, 2, 2. Right, so that it wouldn't catch that case. Let's look, though, at an even more basic problem that I saw. So, sorry, the font's really small here. All right. So what's wrong with if A equals equals B equals equals C? Well, I don't know that you should be able to stare at that and see that it's wrong, but once you code it, you should test it. And if you tested it once, you would see that it doesn't work. So um, all I ask is that you take that code, let's say A equals 10, B equals 10, and C, ooh, C equals 10. All I ask is that we take this code and try it out. Control C.
and it says my triangle is isosceles, even though all the sides were the same length, right? I, I made them all 10. A, C, and B are all 10. Okay, so why does the code say that my triangle is isosceles? Well, because it's not true that A equals equals B equals equals C. Why doesn't that work? That's kind of weird, huh? What's A equals equals B? One. Does one equal equal 10? No. Right, so then that, that code looks like one equals equals C after the first half of it gets simplified. So that's, that's not going to work. Uh, one equals equals C is going to be false. Sorry. So what do we have to do instead? We have to do A equals B and B equals C. And that will be true for the case where you have an equilateral triangle. So at the very minimum, I think you should have tested your code on an equilateral triangle, an isosceles triangle, and a scalene triangle, if you put all three of those in. And then I think you should keep testing with what we call extreme values. So like, I don't know, side lengths of one and a million, or side lengths of zero. And you know what would happen if you put in a negative side length? Maybe you want to interpret that as a positive number or something. Okay, also, uh, this code doesn't work either for the same reason. A is not equal to B is not equal to C will have exactly the same problem. So if I want a test that comes out to be true when all the side lengths are different, then I need, uh, wait, what, did I, what did I say? True when all the side lengths are different. Right, okay. So A not equal B and B not equal C. Does that guarantee me that all the side lengths are different? Yeah? Well, let's put them all in as A not equal B and B not equal C. That does not guarantee me that all the side lengths are different because if I have B equal to 10, 11, Right, A is 10 and C is 10. So all the side lengths are not different. But if I evaluate this, A is not equal to B will be true, and B is not equal to C will be true, yet A and C are equal to each other. Right? So we, have to, we would have to actually test and C is not equal to A. So now that tells me that this is not a scalene triangle, and so I'll come to the fact of it being isosceles. There were a variety of creative bugs of this sort, sort of like the tests weren't quite what you thought they were, and all I can recommend is that your code is not going to behave the way you think it will at the moment that you write it, so you have to test it a thousand times. And in fact, the job that I was interviewing for when I was at the Microsoft interview was a tester position. Do you know the ratio of code testers, people whose entire job it is to run code and see where it breaks, to developers, to code writers at Microsoft? What was that? 50 to 1? 50 testers for one coder? It's not quite that extreme, but it is about 1 to 1. There is one person whose entire job it is just to test code for every person who, whose entire job it is to write code which tells you that if you're testing and writing, you should spend at least as much time testing your code to make sure it works as you did writing in the first place. And maybe more. I don't know what the uh, development line is like on that. So here's an interesting uh, bit of code that it took me a really long time to figure out, actually. Why didn't... Why didn't this code work? So uh, above there is, they're asking for side length capital A, enter a side of the triangle. Actually, I might need to put that on here. Because there is a insidious misuse, uh, reuse of a variable name to mean something else, 
Right, so capital A meant the side length of the triangle initially, and then later it was redefined to be the area as according to the, uh, the area according to Heron's formula calculation. Then later we did the Heron formula calculation again, except now this is the area of the triangle instead of the side length. So it turned out that this one would give you all kinds of this is not a triangle messages even when it was a valid triangle because the, the word had been reused. So it would have been avoided if this had been called area, which is why I like informative uh, variable names and more than one letter variable names. One letter variable names are easy to reuse because you can only have 20 variables, 26 variables before you start reusing names if you're going to insist on having one letter variable names. So that was, that was kind of a creepy little bug that I found. And yeah, I think that's all I want to say about that. So let's do some new stuff today. I want to warn you, we are coming up to the first programming challenge test in this class. So it'll be probably next Tuesday. It will be an in-class just programming challenge you must work alone on that, but you'll, be, you'll have open book, open notes, open any other code you've ever written in this class. And so it'll be a list of different programs you have to write and submit to me during that period, something along those lines. Yes? You'll be working alone, but can you share books? Um, I guess. Do you think that that is a, a risk of people using that to share information? <laughs> okay, one person, yeah, one person uses the book at a time, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah, I think that you can share books. I'll bring my book in case you need an extra. Other questions about that? Okay, so the, the new programming construct I wanted to teach you is something called a while loop. Have you read about while loops? Yes, everyone's read about while loops. Okay, so I could do something like my number is 100, and then while my number is greater than 10, first I'll print my number, disk my number. And then I'll decrement my number by seven. So I'm counting down. All right, so I'll be counting down from 100 by sevens. The way the while loop works is that the test there must be a logical test. That's this part right here. The logical test is either true or false. And so when I get to line two, if the logical test is true, then I go into the loop. I do everything in the loop. And when I get down to end, I go back up to while and I test the logical condition again. Is my number still greater than 10? If it is, then I go down and I subtract seven again from my number. So that means this loop could go on as an unnumbered number of times. I don't know how many times I'll have to execute line three and line four in this loop. So a while loop is different from a for loop in the sense that you don't know how many times the code in a while loop will necessarily execute. But the code in a for loop, you're saying do it 50 times or do it from one to a hundred, so you do the code in the for loop a hundred times. So you use a while loop usually when you don't know how many times you're going to need to do something before you're done. So if I save this as first while, so I, I counted down by sevens from a hundred until I got to 16, when, when my number was 16, I went back up to line, oh, sorry, when my number was 16, 
I displayed 16, and then I subtracted 7 from it, I got 9, and went back up to line 2, and it said, while 9 is greater than 10. Well, 9 is not greater than 10, so I don't enter the while loop anymore, and I end. So notice that one of the conditions is, whatever logical test is, is, the, is the first thing in your while loop, you must be changing the result of that logical test for something in your, at, with something inside your loop, or else your loop will go on forever. So if I commented out this line, then I would just go on forever and ever because my number would never end up being less than 10. I would never be able to stop. I would just print 100, 100, 100 forever. Yes? How do you stop that once we do it? Okay, control C. So if I do it. Control C will break you out of that loop. So I can use this to do something interesting like keep checking to see if somebody is giving me a valid input. This is one thing I use while loops for quite a lot. So let's say I want to do a, a number equals input give me a number between 1 and 10. I might actually want to check that they did give me a number between 1 and 10. Okay. I, could, I could just complain to them. I could just complain to them and say if a number is less than 1 or if a number is greater than 10, I could say that's not a number between one and ten. So I could do that, but that in entails just saying that they messed up, but I can't do anything after it. The, yeah, the double apostrophe is the only way to make a single apostrophe appear in your printout. The f because remember, an apostrophe is a special character. It normally would, would signal the end of the string. But a double apostrophe is how you get actually a an apostrophe to print out. That is a good question. If I wanted a double apostrophe there, I'd probably have to put two more. Two more, I think. For every time you put an apostrophe, that will be interpreted as the end of the string, unless there's another apostrophe after it, in which case it's interpreted as print one apostrophe. I think you should put four. Let me see that I'm right. Again, I never trust my intuition. Yeah, there we go. I got it. Really useful stuff we're learning today. Right, so the problem with this is, if they give me a good number, then I'm happy, but if they give me a bad number, like 23, then all I can do is complain and say, I didn't like that. What I really should do is say, I didn't like that number, try again, and keep asking them until they give me a good number. That's a good, situ that's a good scenario for a while loop, because I don't know how many times I'm going to have to ask this dumb user to give me a number between 1 and 10 before they actually comply. So I might want to put a while loop and say, keep asking them until I get a number between 1 and 10. Right. So this is something that checks to see if it's, if it's not valid. And if it's not a good number, then I should actually ask them again. A number equals input. Try again for a number between 1 and 10. Here. So 
So right now this code will only ask them one extra time. So if they give me the number zero, it'll say that's not right. And if I give zero again, we'll just stop. Actually, what I should do is keep asking, keep asking, keep asking. So how would I do that? Let's see. While a number, while I don't have a valid a number, ask them to try again, right? And I can keep running line four and five, just say that isn't good, try again. I can keep doing that until they give me a number that actually meets my qualifications. So if they try to give me zero, and then they try negative 90, and then they try 23, and then they try 33, and then finally they give me the number nine, we say, that's great, now I have a number between one and 10. So that's a good use of a while loop. Um, another thing you might want to do would be print out, uh, let's say print out the first 10 prime numbers. Print out the first 10 prime numbers. Now, why is that a while loop? Because I know that I'm going to print 10 prime numbers. But why would I kind of need a while loop to do that? Imagine I don't know what numbers are prime. Yes. So I might have to go through, keep going through integers, and only print them out if they're prime. And I should keep going through integers. I don't know how many I'm going to go through before I find my tenth prime or my 100th prime. So if I want to print the first n prime numbers, that might be a while loop. So we're going to write that kind of a while loop. And you can use this function, is prime, which works OK for small numbers. OK, 9 isn't prime, but 11 is prime. So you can use that function. And let's say print the first n prime numbers. And for now, we'll have n equals 10. first n prime numbers. Is one prime? <coughs> we'll say it's not. We'll say it's not, only because MATLAB says it's not. while So when am I going to stop my while loop? I have to add some sort of a test to the while loop. It'll be when I've printed n prime numbers. So I'll have to include a counter somewhere to count how many numbers I have printed out. So I'll let you work on that for a little bit. 